can hear this up the back? Yeah? I thought we were oversubscribed, but we've actually got spare seats. I don't know whether this means people are going to arrive late, but my, my apologies to those of you who are standing up the back there. Um, maybe it would be fair to pinch a seat while you can. <laughs> With apologies to those who arrive late. It's really gratifying to see so many people come to a conference like this. I must say we were completely overwhelmed by the numbers when the uh, subscriptions or or the, the names started coming in. And I think it's a tribute to the concern that people have about juvenile justice issues and juvenile reoffending. Uh, I'm not going to make any speeches about policy today. I'm just going to go quite quickly, perhaps too quickly, through some research that the Bureau's done over the past year. And then Jen's going to open a discussion about policy we're really keen to get your input to this. This is not one of those days where we speak and you all cheer or throw brat <laughs> or throw things, depending on your point of view. Um, we're hoping to get some discussion going, so uh, get your questions ready. Um, you might have lost your seats, but go for it anyway. So without further ado, um, I just what I'm going to do is, uh, as most of you would know, the Young Offenders Act is based on the principles of restorative justice, uh, general no doubt disagree with my simple-minded statement of them, but it involves such things as meeting with the victim, discussing the offence, its impact uh, on the victim and also the reasons from the offender's standpoint for the offence, um, apologising and, and making amends. Now the Bureau has conducted over the past year or so five studies, uh, all of which were designed to try and inform the government's review of the Young Offenders Act. The first one looked at whether or not the sanction hierarchy of the Young Offenders Act is being adhered to. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Act creates a hierarchy of warnings at the lower end, uh, followed by cautions, followed by conferences, uh, with court appearance as the last uh, point of referral. And the general expectation in the Act is subject to a number of constraints that people will make, the young people will make their way up from caution to, from warning to caution to conference and then to court. Second thing we're going to look at is whether or not uh, the results of a study which looked at whether or not people referred to youth justice conferences get their cases dealt with more quickly uh, than people referred to court. Uh, that issue we pursued because there had been long-standing concern on the part of some that one of the reasons for not referring young people to conferences was that they were taking longer to finalise cases than the courts were. The third one is what commitments offenders make in youth justice conferences and whether they fulfil them. Uh, we looked at this issue because it's, there's surprisingly little in the available literature on what young offenders who go to youth justice conferences actually commit to and the extent to which they comply with the commitments they make. Uh, the next one is whether or not uh, youth justice conferences uh, reduce reoffending. And the last one is whether the public supports the principles of restorative justice. So as I say, I'm going to go quickly through these, uh, these uh, five studies and then pass over to Jen. Okay, um, before we get started though, I think it's important to uh, answer four questions which are fundamental to any reform of the way in which we deal with young offenders. The first one is what proportion are reconvicted of a further offence? The second one is amongst those who do reoffend, uh, how frequently do they reoffend? The third is, what's the offence profile of kids who reoffend? Are they coming back for trivial offences or for serious offences or both? And the fourth one is, what proportion of them end up in custody? I take those four issues to be central to the question of whether or not you intervene early or it's safe to take a hands-off attitude or some combination of those two approaches is required. So to answer the questions, I followed up uh, 8,813 young offenders who had their first known uh, caution conference or proven court appearance in 1999. There are no warnings there because the data we have on warnings at this period wasn't reliable. And we followed them up for 10 years, or we didn't make, literally follow them up, we got their criminal records over the next 10 years and looked at the proportion who re-offended, the time to the next offence, the frequency of reconviction, and the seriousness of reoffending. Just stop me if I go too quickly for you, but I'm keen to give Jen maximum time to talk about this. And what we found was that 58% uh, of them were reconvicted in 10 years. Uh, amongst those who had at least one further conviction, the average number of further convictions, that is to say episodes at which they were convicted of at least one offence, was 3.9 odd. 11% ended up in custody. And of course, as you'd expect for Indigenous kids, the situation was far worse. In their case, within that 10-year follow-up, 84% were reconvicted. And by the way, when I say reconvicted, I don't mean cautioned or conferenced, I mean uh, going to a court and being convicted of a further offence. The average number of court appearances at which they were convicted of an offence for Aboriginal kids was six, so more than one every two years. 
and a third of them ended up with a custodial sentence. The pattern's pretty similar regardless of whether or not the index appearance in 1999 was a caution, a conference or a court appearance. Uh, you can see there that even for kids who had a caution, the majority of them were reconvicted in a court of a further offence. Don't pay any attention to the differences you see in the reconviction rates between caution, conference and court appearance. Obviously, that table makes no allowance for differences in the, fo the uh, profile of kids going to conferences or getting a caution or going to court. The point of the table is merely to highlight the fact that this is not something which is being driven by the court appearance results. Okay, what do they commit? Well, it's an extraordinary range of offences. The most common uh, further offence is a drink driving for 13% of them, serious assault resulting in injury for 1 in 10, driving while disqualified for 8.8, .8, break, enter and steal 8%, common assault 6%, um, property damage 4%, aggravated robbery 4%, negligent driving 27 and then after that uh, just a wide range of serious and not so serious offences. That's the profile of reoffending uh, in that 10 year follow up period. Okay, so let's go now to the five studies that I referred to before. The first one being is the sanction hierarchy uh, being adhered to. The author of this study is Elizabeth Moore, who's sitting right at the front here in blue or pur purple, being colourblind, I can't tell which. It'd be blue, wouldn't it, Liz? Purple. Got it wrong. Oh, the defects that I embarrass myself over. Okay, what she did was select all 13,900-odd young people who admitted an offence in 2010 and were dealt with by way of a caution, conference or appearance in court. And she looked at the effect of prior cautions, conferences and court appearances on the likelihood of getting a caution or a conference in the future. That sounds a bit turgid, the graph will make it all clear for you. So, here we're looking at the bottom, you've got the index appearance in 2010, whether they had a police caution, a youth justice conference, or a court appearance. And what we're going to look at is their prior history in terms of cautions. Everybody got that right? Okay. So, for those who got a police caution, 78% of them had no prior police caution. It's kind of encouraging, that's what you'd expect. 17% uh, had one prior caution, 4.5% had two, and 0.4%, almost nobody, had more than three, which is what you'd expect under the Act. The Act prohibits, or I think I'm right about this, prohibits more than three cautions, and uh, there are very few who get that. For those whose index appearance with the Youth Justice Conference, only 45, 46% of them uh, had, oh sorry, 46% of them had no prior caution, which is a little bit surprising. 24% um, of them had one prior caution, 16% had two, and 15% had uh, three or more. As far as the court group, those who turned up in court, a third of them had no prior caution, not quite what you would have expected. 26% um, of them had one prior caution, 21% had two, and 17% had three or more. So moving on now to prior youth justice conferences. 98% of those who got a police con caution had no prior youth justice conference. That's exactly what you'd expect. 1.7% uh, had one prior conference and almost nobody had two and nobody had more than three. So that, that much at least is inconsistent with what you'd expect under the Act. As far as those whose index appearance was a youth justice conference, 86% of them had no prior youth justice conference. So uh, it doesn't look like y you get many of these if you've had uh, turning up for one and there's the evidence for it. About 11% had had one, 2.5% uh, had had two, and 0.4% had had three plus. Very rare indeed. For the court group, 80% um, of them uh, had no prior youth justice conference, which is surprising. You would have expected to see more of them with the youth justice conference, bearing in mind that there are legislative overrides. 16% uh, had one prior conference, 3% had two, and 1.3% had three plus. So finally, coming up to the... Uh, uh, Prior court experience, police caution, well, as you'd expect, 95% of those who got a police caution haven't had a previous court appearance, although uh, there are some, clearly, who get a caution after having turned up in court. Uh, for youth justice conferencing, 76% of them uh, hadn't had any prior contact with the court system, which is encouraging. 15% uh, of them had one prior contact with the court system, which had proven offence. 5% had had two, and 5% had had three plus. For those who turned up in court, 50% uh, of them uh, hadn't been to court before, 19% had been once, 12% had been twice, and 20%. So in summary, basically the sanction hierarchy does appear to be adhered to. 
Most of those getting a caution haven't had one before and less than 1% uh, have had three or more. A slim majority of those getting youth justice conferencing have had a caution before, not quite what you'd expect. Uh, most of those going to court have been cautioned before, but, and these are important buts, uh, less than half of those going to a youth justice conference have had a previous caution, and most of those who are going to court have no previous youth justice conference uh, experience. So, moving on quickly, all that reasonably clear? Okay, moving on to the question of whether they take long to finalise cases. This, it's been said, is one of the reasons why police have been reluctant to refer uh, young people to youth justice conferences. And the study author here is, again, the redoubtable Elizabeth Moore. Take a bow. <laughs> uh, you'll find her work on, for, on this topic on Bureau Brief 74. What she did was look at three case cohorts, 730 police-referred conferences. These were kids who were referred to the conference by police. Uh, 951 court-referred conferences, so they went from the police to the courts and from the courts to youth justice conferencing, and 1,482 uh, court finalisations, kids whose cases were finalised in court. She applied the youth justice conference exclusion criteria to all of them, so they all would have been eligible to be dealt with by a conference, and she controlled in addition for the number of concurrent offences, uh, index appearance, uh, the region for youth, uh, juvenile justice, prior contacts, etc., etc. In other words, she did her level best to ensure that these were all cases that were alike and could have been dealt with in youth justice conference, whatever. So how long did it take to finalise? Well, if it was a police-referred conference, the median number of days to finalise the case was 55. Uh, big cheer for the court finalisations. They came in second at 64 days. And if they got to a youth justice conference via the court, they took a lot longer. So. Far from it being the case that youth justice conferences take longer to finalise cases than the court, they're actually somewhat quicker. So the next study is uh, what commitments offenders make in youth justice conferences. And the study uh, researcher here is Isabel Tausig, who's also down in the second row, if you want to chase her up at coffee. Um, she, this is a descriptive analysis of juvenile justice data and BOXA youth justice conferencing data. And I'm sure she'd expect me, and uh, I'd like to thank Juvenile Justice for providing this data and making it so open and accessible to us. So we're dealing with kids who are dealt with in the period 2009 to 2010. So these are the outcomes they agreed to. 79.6%, uh, sorry, 80% agreed to make an apology, either verbal or written. 68% um, of them agreed to undertake some form of personal development, I think from memory. Uh, Isabel, this was like anger management or seeing a psychologist. 28.7% uh, agreed to do community work. 8.6% agreed to financial repara reparation. 4.9% agreed to do some work for the victim. And 0.6% agreed to give a, to make a gift in kind. And I don't know what that was. Can you help? <laughs> well, I'm not sure what that was. Someone here will know better than we do. Okay, what's the compliance rate? Well, it's very high um, for all of these. 89% uh, of those who said they were going to apologise did, either verbally or in writing. 88% uh, agreed to personal development. I won't read all the numbers out, but you can see the compliance rate is very high for all of those things. So, offenders always nearly always apologise. A large proportion engage in some measure which the conference participants, at least, or the convener, hope will reduce the risk of further offending, and a large proportion... Um, depending on your point of view, undertake some form of community work. So the next study now uh, we're dealing with is one that was done by Nadine uh, Smith and myself. Uh, we looked at whether or not or how effective youth justice conferences are in reducing reoffending compared with the children's court. Uh, the method used was propensity score matching. I'm sure nobody here wants me to describe propensity score matching, but if you do want to know what it's all about, uh, you'll find it in Crime and Justice Bulletin 160. Essentially, it's a way in which you can match two groups in terms of factors that would otherwise influence selection into treatment. So we wanted to make sure that the two groups we were comparing, the court group and the youth justice conferencing group, were alike in terms of the factors that would determine which way they went. Uh, she applied the uh, youth justice conferencing exclusion offenders, so all these offenders could have been dealt with either way. And in addition, um, I'll come to that, we also did the analysis on the basis of intention to treat. If you don't know uh, too much about evaluation, it's very important when you do these comparisons to include people who are referred to treatment but who don't actually undertake treatment. Otherwise, you end up with selection bias. Um, so we compared that. There weren't uh, a large percentage, of, if I remember rightly, Nadine, who didn't, um, having agreed or hadn't been referred to a youth justice conference, actually undertake one. 
But we also uh, did something else which is quite important in this context, and that is that we analyse the data with and without justice procedure offences. Now, justice procedure offences include things like breaching a suspended sentence or breaching an AVO. They're the sort of offences that can be can turn up on a child's record as a result of the way in which police choose to exercise their discretion, and they can skew your results. And we were worried that those who went to court might, for example, be uh, surveilled more intensely by police and accumulate more justice procedure offences uh, than those who go to a youth justice conferencing. So we analysed the data with justice procedure offences included and then pulled them out and analysed it again. The outcomes we were interested in were the proportion reconvicted of a new offence within 24 months, the time to the first reconviction for those who had one, the seriousness of the most serious offence compared with the one that the index appearance and the frequency of reconviction. So what were the results? Well, as most of you know, they were pretty disappointing. Uh, we found no significant effect for any of these measures, regardless of whether or not we included just justice procedure offences or removed them. And indeed, pretty much the same results when we included people who actually did go to a youth justice conference and, and agree to an outcome plan. So that's just an illustration of the sort of results, in case you don't like text for the results. Here you're looking at, along the bottom, the number of days from their, their index appearance, where they went to a youth justice conference or they went to court. On the, uh, on the uh, y-axis, what you've got is a proportion who have not yet re-offended. As you can see over time, there are fewer and fewer who have not yet re-offended. But the really salient point about this graph is that if you look at the two lines for conference and court, they overlap. At any particular point in time, the proportion who've re-offended is the same in both groups, and that effect holds up regardless of whether you institute uh, adjustments for other differences between the, the, the groups. Okay, so there's no evidence that youth justice conferencing with this group uh, is any more effective than the children's court in reducing the risk frequency or seriousness of offending. So what does the public think about uh, restorative justice? Well, the state author here is Elizabeth Moore again. It's with great heavy heart that she's left us and gone to better pastures, but... Uh, this is some of the work she's done. This is Bureau Brief 77, if you want to follow up the details. Uh, what we did was uh, get a market research company to, have to uh, survey 2,530 New South Wales residents. This is quota sampling. In other words, the group is matched for the population on age and gender. Um, the questions that we asked them were uh, level of support for offenders doing unpaid work, support for victims telling offenders about the harm they've caused, and support for victims having a say in how the offender should make amends. This wasn't restricted to young offenders. I say that because basically we wanted to replicate a British study that was very similar and which wasn't restricted uh, to young offenders. But I think the results have uh, equal bearing on, on uh, young offenders. Okay, so what support do we have? Well, 91% of them uh, supported the idea that offenders uh, who commit theft and vandalism offences should be required to do unpaid work. Still very strong support for the same thing for those who are convicted of assault, 81%. As far as having an opportunity to tell offenders about the harm and stress that the offence has caused, 86%, very high support for that, for theft and vandalism offenders, and even higher support, although the difference is almost certainly not significant. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. 88% um, support that for assault. And a little bit lower support for the idea that victims should have a say in how offenders should make amends, but still very strong support, 73% compared with 75%. So very strong. And what we found was that the support was even stronger amongst women, uh, victims of crime, those who live in regional areas, those with lower educational achievements, and those who think the courts are too lenient. The details of that are in Elizabeth's bulletin. So that's basically my story. That's the summary of results. Um, now Jenny Bargan, who's written a great deal on juvenile justice and, in case you don't know, actually ran the Youth Justice Conferencing Program in New South Wales for many years. Over to you, Jen. Thanks, Don. Um, now how do I... Slides. Just... Just go straight into him, doesn't it? Craig will rescue us at this point. Just make light conversation for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation on whose land we are meeting. 
and in particular make the acknowledgements to elders past and present, but also the children and young people from Aboriginal communities who are so overrepresented, as many of Don's studies and other work has indicated and have been for many years, and in fact that data, um, those numbers and that proportion seems to be getting worse rather than better over the years. So I think that factor alone um, should alert us to some of the directions that we should be taking uh, in thinking about what sort of response we want to have um, to children and young people and in particular to Aboriginal children and young people. So having said that, um, just an outline of some of the things I want to say briefly because I do want to give you the opportunity to ask questions and for perhaps Don and I to have a bit of discussion with your input um, after I've sort of briefly gone through the many slides that I over-prepared last night. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I want to take us to the bigger picture. What are Australia's international commitments in the area of responding to offending by children and young people? And how much are we complying with those commitments? Um, then just move briefly to some of the other research that tells us, fills in the gaps about who are children who get into trouble with the law? What sort of background do these children most commonly come from? And are we addressing some of those issues that are writ large outside of the juvenile justice system? Um, but we're sort of seem to be asking the juvenile justice system on its own to address. And I'm wondering whether we should be just thinking more outside the square. Um, then I'll make some brief comments on the reports that Don has uh, summarised and perhaps think about other foci that we could adopt for perhaps a more rounded picture and then give you what my vision for the future is which may or may not be the same as yours. So, looking at international instruments, basically I've just cherry-picked. Um, Australia is a signatory um, to a number of international instruments, principally Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, but those instruments in total um, say that we should have a focus on diversion, and yes, the Young Offenders Act was designed to do that. Um, we should be using alternative responses outside of criminal justice, wherever possible and appropriate, and I'm not sure we're doing that. Um, we should pay attention to children's voices. Article 12 of Convention of the Rights of the Child says the child has a right to be heard in all decisions that are going to affect their lives. How often are we listening to children and young people, really listening, and ensuring that they are part of the decision-making process? Um, that victims have a right to have say, and I think the last report that Don mentioned says that victims are quite keen to have a say in general, um, and certainly there are parts of the system that allow that to occur. Um, and finally, just going back to my first comment, every year the UN uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child says Australia's not doing well in addressing the issues for Indigenous young people. Uh, Overrepresentation is is appalling. 25% when I start, started working in this field many years ago, I won't tell you how many, uh, now the proportion of Aboriginal um, children and young people who are locked up in New South Wales is 50% and growing. And I think that is a, a, um, <coughs> an occasion for shame on our part and it should stimulate us to very serious rethinking about how we're doing and what we're doing uh, in this very important area. Okay, so the Bureau's research tells us a lot about what the numbers tell us, but does it tell us about who these children are, where they're coming from, what sort of backgrounds they have and so on? So what do we really know about children and young people in trouble with the law? Well, the qualitative research tells us some, and it's a good start. Uh, Mixed methods research tells us more, so qualitative and quantitative research. Um, the, the qualitative research um, fills in the gaps, if you like, and tells us about the children. And we have some health studies over recent years that tell us about children in custody and children on uh, community orders. 
that every time I read them, I feel like weeping. I think the children that we are dealing with at the back end of juvenile justice processes are amongst the most damaged and distressed of all children in the community. Um, is it appropriate that it is only at that point that the, they get the services and the care, the three meals a day, the birthday cards and so on, um, that they don't ordinarily get living in their communities? What can we do about that? So, what about the types of offences? Now, I think the re-offending graph that Don showed you with the sorts of offences that children are coming back for indicates that, yes, there are some serious offences in there. Nine percent of those re-offending um, children are coming back for serious assaults. That's a worry. Why is that? Maybe that's related to what the anecdotal evidence that we have about children who are in out-of-home care uh, where carers are calling police when children act out, uh, whereas if they were in a, um, a competent family, I suppose, um, parents would not even think about calling police. So we're looking at those children who are already disadvantaged and damaged because they're in out-of-home care, uh, entering into the system in ways that other children um, would not be appearing. So can we do something about that before uh, those children are um, being put in front of police notice? Okay, so, um, oh, this is what, yes, I'll just go through this quickly. I'm not going to read them. Um, we all know those. You read any standard text on juvenile justice, Canine and White, etc., etc., uh, you'll find all those points set out in great detail. Um, what proportion, and I think it's important again to stand back from the current research and say, well, yes, we know about the internal data and how that crunches, um, and it crunches in ways that should concern us, but how about overall? Are we looking at a huge proportion of children and young, of the total proportion of children and young people? And the answer is no. So I've just sort of drawn um, some of that data. Some of it's getting a little old, but I think the point is not to sort of um, very carefully go through exactly what proportion, but to think about um, the fact that if you look at the converse of what we're looking at today, most children grow up in um, good enough families and end up in as good enough working, committed um, adults who are contributing to society. So we're looking at a relatively small proportion of all children and young people. Okay, now just in case you haven't seen them, what do the surveys of young people in custody tell us? Well, that's what partly what they tell us and, and more. Those should be cause for concern. These are the children and young people who are funnelled into having gone through, in many cases, a number of responses and come back and they're in those re-offending um, statistics. Um, and when they end up in custody in general, they have a huge range of disadvantages and deficits. Um, the same report um, indicates quite clearly that for Aboriginal children those social determinants are significantly worse. And then the same report says, well, let's use custody as an opportunity to assess these health needs, provide social and emotional support and improve life skills and health status for this highly disadvantaged population and make sure we're doing that once they're released from custody. Is it too late? By the time those children get into custody again and again and again, uh, who bears the responsibility for addressing those needs? Surely our focus should be, yes, those who are already in the system, but going back to what's happening in communities, what's happening uh, to um, <coughs> for this, these sort of results to be at the end point of the system. 
The other element that I think is important when we're thinking about competency and participation is Pamela Snow's more recent work on oral language competence and thinking about the sort of process that a youth justice conference is and a properly delivered police caution is, where we are, are expecting children um, to speak clearly and sometimes <laughs> eloquently uh, about what they've done, recognise the harm they've caused, speak in the presence of an often angry victim and so on. If these children fall into that percentage, and it is a relatively large percent of children whose oral language competence is not well developed for their developmental stage, are we expecting too much? And I'll just leave that question open for us. Okay, so what's happening in contemporary juvenile justice? Just a question for you. Are we policing young criminals are, or are we responding to and working with developing children and young people who are plagued by significant disadvantage? And just a quick reminder, the system is more complex than just the Young Offenders Act. Uh, there are many sets of laws that are applicable. Um, the development of policy over recent years in particular has been a fairly uh, tortuous process. Maybe it's always been that way. Um, and not only is the Bureau doing all this good work, but there's also a plethora of other reviews um, that are either about to be released or have been released and are awaiting some response from the attorney in particular. Um, okay. So, um, I said I'd do that briefly. I'm sorry if, if you all knew that. I'm sure many of you do. Um, but I think it's important to remind ourselves just who are these children, what sort of context are those children in. So, um, in response to the reports, how am I going on time, Craig? Yep. Yeah? Okay. So, is reoffending the key question? I think it's the key political question. But I think we also need to remind ourselves of the age crime curve which has been found in not only in Australia but also in other countries that the age for peak offending is between 15 and 24. So if you're looking at whether children and young people will come back to notice uh, more than adults will, and that's, I know that's not been the focus of your studies, um, it's highly likely that they will come back to notice more often. While they're in that developmental period where they're testing the boundaries for some children, or where they don't have, they have significant social deficits, we are likely to see children coming back more often than we would see older people as they move on and desist from offending. So the process of um, desisting from offending for young people from the research, and there is some really good desistance research, is quite different for that um, for older people. Okay, so as I've said before, um, we, we need qualitative research to flesh out the number crunching that's been done by Boxer. Um, I think it's a really good start, but we need to go further. Um, the second point, um, did the Young Offenders Act, um, or does the Young Offenders Act, it hasn't been repealed yet, um, say that offending is a primary, a re reducing reoffending is a primary objective of the Act or the scheme of conferencing? Do we know the answer? The answer to that is no. Um, there is no um, overt object in the Young Offenders Act that says this Act is designed to reduce reoffending. Um, you can read some in, um, particularly in the conferencing objectives, um, but it has much more complex and overriding objectives. Um, but I think, you know, we also, as I've said, need to recognise that designing, and maybe that's too kind a word, a system for responding to young offenders, um, is a difficult task, and no system that focuses on offending behaviour can actually address the fundamental issues that lead to that offending behaviour. Uh, we need, as I said before, to think and act outside that square. So, just reframing the reoffending study, why not think about it positively? Um, nearly half of all the young people who were cautioned, participated in a conference or appeared in court did not reoffend within 10 years. Isn't that good news? 
right? If we continually look at those who re-offended or reappeared, um, we're starting to convince ourselves that we've got a, a problem, and we do, particularly where Aboriginal children is concerned. No matter how you try to frame those results, they tell us a very uh, a picture that should give us great concern. Um, and as I've mentioned before, we need to unpick and explain the offences. I'd like to see more data crunching done on that. You know, the offences for which children are coming back to notice. Um, comparing conferencing with court. Is it like comparing apples and oranges? Perhaps not in the way that it was done. Um, but I think, again, we need to go back to the objects of the legislation and the implications for practice. We also need to recognise that the reports have been framed in terms of overall statewide um, results. I would very much like to see that broken down by um, YJC area, police regional area and so on uh, in more detail um, for pretty well all the results that um, are published in those reports. It would be much more useful for practice and administration of the scheme under the Young Offenders Act to have more data, and I know you've got the data, but more data presented in ways that break it down by area. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I also think we need to be careful in making assumptions about, um, for example, youth justice conferences. Are they all the same? I think Elizabeth's report indicates that they aren't. Um, where you have um, conferences where the only people present are the convener and the young person at a conference, and certainly there was a proportion of the conferences in Elizabeth's study. No, Isabel, sorry. <laughs> Isabel's study um, where that was the case. Now, in my mind, that's not even a caution, let alone a youth justice conference, uh, where you have a very small proportion of victims participating in conferences. Is that a restorative process? Um, where you have um, times to conference varying across the state, um, where you have the time taken for a conference varying, um, these are all factors that are complex factors, but if they could be taken into account, even in the data um, crunching exercises, it might give us a slightly different picture of those results. I was also pleased to see some of the alternative explanations that were mentioned, I think, in Don and Nadine's report on reoffending. Um, <coughs> but we do need to ask these questions. Are conferences well administered? I'm not sure that the report, the studies so far, tell us the answers to those questions or what needs to be done. Um, has the profile of young people who are participating in conferences changed over the years? And what, are the what is the relevance of the conference experience itself uh, in limiting or reducing future offending by young people. There's some very early work by um, Gabriel Maxwell and her colleagues on the New Zealand Family Group Conferencing Scheme that picked apart what happened and spoke to young people and victims and families and so on. What actually happened at the conference? Did you feel shamed? Did you feel that you understood the harm and so on? And I think those are relevant factors in thinking about uh, if we must, whether conferences reduce reoffending. Okay, um, do they take longer um, if they're court referred or police referred? Um, well, um, let's go back to uh, compliance with sanction studies. Just one comment, comment on that. Um, the limitation on the number of occasions on which a child was, can be cautioned uh, was introduced on the basis of very little evidence. And in fact, at the time it was introduced, um, the evidence was indicating that only a very, an incredibly small proportion of children and young people were being cautioned more than three times by police. So a political decision, uh, but one that has repercussions, I think, over the long term and may mean, and I'd like to see some research on this, that children are being referred to conference or more likely, given the data on um, children appearing in court, uh, 
proceedings are being commenced against those children because, simply because they have been um, dealt with by way of caution on three or more occasions. Um, it seems to me that this work indicates quite strongly that those particular provisions should be repealed. Um, I think it always helps. Um, up to, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is the comparison between police, sorry, between um, courts, court finalisation and youth justice conference finalisation appropriate? I think it's okay to do that. Um, but I think we need to perhaps go behind some of that data. Uh, Isabel's report indicates that the, t the decision to refer to a conference by police often takes a very long time. So that factor hasn't been taken into account in, in that study, um, comparing conferences and courts in finalisation. So maybe count back behind um, the police referrals to conference and compare that time so that um, you're looking at perhaps more closely aligned data. Um, and just a, a simple comment that I know conveners are very well aware of as our conference administrators. Uh, one of the reasons why court referred conferences may be taking a long time, and it certainly was a challenge um, when I was director, was that a police, a court referred conference often has very little information about um, the victim. Uh, and for conveners to go out and find the victim, it may take quite a while for administrators to actually get that information, which ultimately has to come from police. So it's matching records and, and doing all the work that needs to be done and then going out and finding the victim. So by that time, time has elapsed. Um, and perhaps that's one of the reasons, and I'm only guessing, why victim participation rate is somewhat problematic. I'm going to skip through a couple here, and just very briefly. Now, I acknowledge quite strongly that Isabel's work um, could not be as detailed as the work that was done by uh, Lily Trimbley on the first 18 months of the operation of the conferencing scheme. But I'd like to see um, the Trimbley report repeated, because I think um, that it is Quite rightly, a mix of qualitative and quantitative work. Uh, people who participated in conferences, police, etc., etc., were all asked about their experience. Um, there's a couple of references in the res in the, the reports that we're talking about today um, that sort of suggest that the Trimbley report was really mainly about satisfaction of participants with. Uh, preparation process and outcome, but it was much more than that. It actually recognised the complexity of the scheme under the Young Offenders Act and looked at whether or not the various requirements under the Act were being met. Um, but there are some very serious causes for concern uh, when you do compare similar findings from both reports, and in my view the most serious cause for concern is the one I've underlined. Uh, if we are only getting statewide, and I know it varies by area, and again I would have liked to have seen variations by area published on this, if we are only getting statewide 41% of conferences with victim participation, are conferences a restorative justice process? Or are they something else? And should they be called something else? Um, Lily Trimbley found that conference timelines were not being complied with. The legislation was amended to allow 21 day, from 21 days, if practical, to 28 days from receipt of referral. We know it takes, if you're going to do thorough and adequate and proper preparation, and one of the things Don and I were talking about before was um, identifying the correlates, the issues that have led that young person to um, committing the offence and to make sure that there are services available who, with whom to link the child 
then that takes time and effort and thought and patience. And it can't be done, for most cases, uh, within that 20, even 28 days. Uh, on average, in the first 18 months, I think it was about 44, 40 to 44 days um, that conferences were taking from acceptance of referral to holding the conference. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment on adult conferencing where there are no legislative time frames, but sometimes it takes two, three years before those conferences will occur from the original referral. So, you know, we need to think a bit more smartly about should we be putting limitations? I mean, the other side of that argument is for children and young people in particular and for victims of less serious offences, a long time, when a long time elapses between the offence and the response to the offence, there's often a great deal of forgetting about what happened and the nature and the level of the harm that's been caused. And certainly one of those international instruments, well all of them, say we should be responding quickly and appropriately and timelessly to offending by children. So it's a balancing act. I don't think we've found the right balance yet and I'm wondering whether it's, that's ever possible. Yeah. I think just moving on to finish because Craig sort of didn't me the evil eye, yeah, I've got to wind up. Um, so, a vision for the future, and I promised you I'd do this. Um, Recognise, as I said before, that no system of juvenile justice can be really, truly designed to address those underlying issues. Um, the issues of poverty, the issue of failing families, the issue of socio-economic disadvantage. Let's think of outside the square and think earlier rather than later. Let's acknowledge, and I know we do, those of you who work in the system deal with this every day, but let's acknowledge and really think sensibly about what, how we can respond to this. Colonisation, dispossession, government policies past and present are strongly related to high levels and increasing levels of Aboriginal overrepresentation. We're just not doing it right in that area. So for the future, I join my voice with those who say, let's seriously look at justice reinvestment. Let's seriously um, think about moving funds from back end to front end, identifying communities that are failing their children and young people, working with those in collaboration with those communities to address the issues at the grassroots level rather than waiting for those kids to be in custody where we know we can provide services. And for all children, I think we could do worse than revisit a report that was published in 1999 that looked at pathways to prevention, developmental and early intervention approaches. And I'll leave it there um, because I know we'd like to have a discussion. Thank you. Uh, I can hardly see you out there, but yes. I assume there are going to be lots of questions and Craig has a microphone, so it's over to you. Everyone's shy. Ah, okay. oh, there's somebody up the I back there. Great. Uh, we're recording this, so if you don't mind speaking in the microphone, otherwise it won't pick up your voice. I am interested in what research is actually done on uh, the reasons for uh, juvenile reoffending. I mean, what do they actually say? Do we do we actually interview those? We did a uh, study on that. Pia Salmalainen for the bureau some years ago interviewed kids in custody and asked them uh, to offer their view about why they offended. And, and the reasons were not that surprising. Money to buy drugs, thrills, um, those sorts of explanations were common. It's going back a few years, but if you want the full detail, you'll find the report on our website, it's Um But others who might remember the report better than I could maybe fill in some of the blanks. So the ones I remember most were the thrills, money for drugs, money period was one of them. Um, Craig, can you remember? I can't recall, to be honest, no. Other than that. Interesting to know, I mean, to what extent would... Or to what extent would these reoffenders actually look for, seek for ways to actually prevent themselves from reoffending? I'm sort of thinking of, you know, the... Yeah, look, they, they would like to be able to commit to sure. changing their, their path. 
I haven't done a, a personally haven't done a study, and we, as the bureau, hasn't done a study on kids' accounts of their own offending. But you'd be aware there'd be a, there's a vast literature out there on programs that are effective in reducing young people offending. Most of these programs involve teaching young people how to manage, for example, their anger, uh, or deal with the underlying drug and alcohol problems that might be responsible for them getting involved in income generating property crime. Uh, they're the sorts of things that work, but I'm not a phenomenologist, so you'd have to ask somebody else uh, to speak to the question of what kids are thinking when they do it. I've seen it, but I haven't studied it. <laughs> I, I also think that we do need to be careful not to shoot responsibility for change home solely to children and young people when we know uh, what the correlates are, the context in which those children who are really ending up in the back end think about the health survey, but also think about failing communities, failing families, disadvantage and so on. That's not children's responsibility to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, good question. I don't know the answer. I think we need some more qualitative research and we need to think more carefully about context. Maybe I'll get Craig to watch the, yeah, the yeah. order. Um, I have a question, but firstly, um, I was just going to, in response to your question, um, in the Young Person in Custody survey done by Devon Indig, it does, um, one of the surveys was the CTQ test, which asks young people why they did crime. So that's... Um, you know, that's quite interesting. But I was, going to, I was just going to comment on the, um, the, the participation of victims in youth justice conferencing. I've done conferencing for many, many years. And I think while, while restorative justice is a major and very important aspect of youth, youth justice conferencing, I think the, there's also the um, you know, getting the young people to identify issues and linking them in, into support, which is really, really powerful. And I think when you look at some of the crimes, in the case of shoplifting, for example, it's incredibly difficult to get um, you know, people from Woolworths or, or BP, etc., to attend conferences. Sorry, yeah. it's incredibly difficult to get people from shops when someone's done shoplifting to a conference, and it's actually not necessarily that useful, if I can be a bit controversial. So, so in some cases, for example, assault or stealing from a person if someone's stolen your laptop, that's incredibly powerful. But to get a rep from Woolies um, is not only difficult, but it's actually not that useful. It's not that personal. I agree. Can I comment yeah, yeah. on that? Yeah. Um, and I think that raises questions about the nature of the offences that are being dealt with by way of conference, not about the process. Um, that um, in the Attorney General's own review of the operation of the Act, the police argued, and in fact there was a recommendation of that review, that minor shoplifts should be able to be dealt with by way of caution. And I think a caution is probably a better way because police can give the child the information about the ripple effect of multiple shoplifts from you know, many different... Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think that's a long, longer and other debate, really. I think there are ways in which cautions perhaps can do that. Uh, Jenny, you were suggesting that, or hypothesising that um, the drop in the percentage of victims attending conferences might be causal in the non-finding of an effect on reoffending. I was wondering, Don, have you actually looked at that as a cross-factor in, in that study? Did you look at see if there's an association between the... Um, victims attending and effect size? No, we haven't. And I might say this both about what Jen had to say about Isabel's work and also about our work, is that you've got to remember when you're trying to do this job properly and you're trying to match like cases with like, you very quickly run out of cases if, the, if you start chopping up the data by region or start chopping it up according to whether the victim attended. We can have a look at those issues, but do bear in mind that stats rapidly become pretty meaningless when you get down to very small sample sizes. We haven't looked at that issue. I acknowledge that there are ways in which you could redesign youth justice conferencing that might make it work. It's possible that it does work in some locations, but not in others. Uh, but frankly, with the data available, that's the best we could do, I think, at the moment. I think that's a fair response. and The numbers are relatively small. You know, keep in mind what I said about, you know, youth justice conferencing is 
this proportion of all the responses in juvenile justice, I think somewhere between 4 and 6%, you know, varies around the state. You know, we're not talking about huge numbers, so being able to um, cut down mm. in terms of various variables is, is quite difficult. And I'd also be very careful, and maybe this academic coming through here, you know, causation is, is a really problematic word. You know, maybe it's related, maybe it's not. Oh, I have to jump in there. I'm, I'm very comfortable with the word causation. Look, I think the problem for the government, and I'll be provocative here, the fundamental problem for the government is it has a choice between a program which has got mass public support, but which doesn't have a lot of evidence to back it up in terms of free offending, and other programs which do have a lot. It's perfectly true what people say, that youth justice conferencing might work with some offenders. It's possible even that it could be modified to work for all offenders. But the dilemma for government is it has to make a choice between programs that are known to work and which there's no academic division over whether they work to reduce reoffending, and programs where there is division. And to make matters even more complicated, as Jen points out, and I readily agree, reducing reoffending is not the only game in town. Doing justice is also important. Making sure you've got a sanction which the public respects is important. So these aren't easy policy decisions to make. Question for you, Jenny. Um, I was interested to note the, um, the statistic about police um, commencing charges on Indigenous children aged between 10 and, and 18 um, at 50%, um, whereas on non-Indigenous it was much less. Has there been any research done to indicate why that's happening, given the changes in um, police recruiting cultural awareness education programs with police? Uh, look, part of the difficulty is that uh, when you just look at Aboriginal kids, outcomes for them compared with outcomes for non-Aboriginal kids, it's not just the indigeneity that differs between them. There are differences in the offences they're doing, there are differences in their prior contacts with police, there are differences in the communities and the availability of people to look after them. We haven't done any definitive work on this, and I think the area of cautioning and cautioning policy badly needs research. It's just hard to do. Mm -hmm. But it has never really been done. There's nothing no. published looking as at closely as caut at cautions um, as there has been on you know the plethora of reports on youth justice conflict. It worries me when you look at other parts where there's there's so standing back, look at the systems in particular, do some really. Um, in terms of um, youth justice conferencing, the Victorian model is quite different and they did a review last year which seemed to show that there was an improvement or reduction in recidivism. Now their model only allows young people to participate if it's a very serious offence. Um, they have to be looking at um, a probationary order um, and they also do other things like they apparently have much more follow-up, they have full-time people running the con who work in the system full-time running the conferences. So, um, which is quite different from ours, where there's a lot of retirees and retired policemen, people like that, who you know may do a brilliant job. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but it's a different model altogether. So, I'm just wondering if New South Wales would has looked at you know the Victorian model and wondered, you know, if there's anything that can be added to it. Can I, in response to that, the Victorians stood back for a long time. Quite rightly, I thought. Um, that's what they often do. Um, they, have <laughs> they have far fewer young people caught up in juvenile justice responses than most other Australian jurisdictions. But they sensibly said, OK, let's look at what everyone else is doing. And they made the decision. I can remember going to meetings with them and what we were doing and, I, and people from other jurisdictions were doing this. And they looked at what each of the Australian jurisdictions had been doing. And they made quite a deliberate decision that, yes, um, some form of restorative justice could appropriately be introduced into trouble, but that response should be reserved for more serious offenders appearing before court where the court was considering the equivalent of what we call a custodial where the court was considering a serious penalty for the, a serious offence. The conferencing scheme in Victoria, and that's such a luxury, 
um, and it'd be great if we could do it in New South Wales, is run by non-government organisations uh, who are reasonably funded and And, uh, you know, I, I think that it's worth considering whether the Victorian scheme is one that we should uh, introduce in New South Wales. So move away from the public view that conferences are for first and minor offenders, no matter what the attorney said in his second reading speech, which was conferences are not for first and minor offenders and should not be used. Um, for first offenders, unless the circumstances of the offence are such, bones, such a response, uh, and look at, even though it takes longer to get to conference, court referred conferences, back end children. Want to comment from me on that? Um, we can all we can all speculate on the possibility of the Victorian system is better than the New South Wales system, but there's no substitute at the end of the day for doing the evidence, getting the research, finding out which one works. The Victorian evaluation, frankly, wasn't up to scratch, um, and very f one of the big problems in the whole field of restorative justice is a lot of the evaluations are not done by people who are indifferent to the outcome, uh, and they are not. Uh, objective, and I think this is, if advocates really want to pursue restorative justice, it's up to universities to try out different models, or persuade communities or governments to work with them to try out different models, because you just can't go on a song and a prayer, you just can't go on the basis that we think if we tweak this, it's going to work, so let's do it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> the problem with academic research is the time lag, though. You know, that's... Uh, you know, one of the challenges for Don and the, and the Bureau staff in getting reports out quickly enough to be able to um, on to what are the current issues. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, uh, the previous Labor government were doing a lot of work out in um, Western Sydney and some of the large um, uh, old department com commission sort of communities. Uh, Minto was one of them rebuilding those communities with, with a view to improving the, the social uh, outcomes for people out there. I'm wondering, is there any research about whether that um, large investment in public money, how, whether, whether that has impacted on crime rates or, or you know, participation in juvenile justice? Yeah, look, uh, as my understanding of the evidence on community investment is that the outcomes are not terribly good. Um, as opposed to investment in programs directed at families and young young people. That's my understanding of the state of the art uh, on that. I know that's controversial for people, and I know it sounds like the best thing you could possibly do would be to try and reshape an entire community in the hope that that will do something for the kids. Maybe it's because the money doesn't go where it's meant to, but the evidence ain't good. Who's Hank? Oh, there's a question dying to be asked up the back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering whether we have um, any information about what those court outcomes were when you're comparing the outcome of court and YJC. We know at the end of a conference there's an outcome plan and there is some task that the child is going to have to perform. At the end of the court outcomes, were those broken up into whether that was a dismissal, whether, you know, they went for supervision, whether it was a custodial order, because it seems to me we're comparing apples and oranges. We know 
what the outcome from YJC is, but there could have been intensive supervision, there could have been a custodial order, or perhaps a much lesser outcome. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, let me explain in case one of your concerns is that the kids uh, who went to court might have been locked up and couldn't reoffend. We took that into account, so the time to reoffend takes into account uh, any time spent in custody. Yes, whatever happened in court would have been what whatever normally happens in court, and that could have been anything from a fine to a, uh, a bond or, or whatever else. All we know is that the two groups of offenders are exactly alike uh, in terms of the factors that determine whether you go to court or you go. You go. So we can't unpick uh, the court outcomes and say, well, this is why it was the same or this is why it wasn't the same. Having said that, we have done other research which has looked at um, whether kids who get a custodial penalty are more likely to reoffend or less likely to reoffend than kids who get a non-custodial penalty. So we have looked at individual sanctions and once again we find no effect. It doesn't seem to matter what penalty they get. And I think David Tate's work seems to suggest that very few of these court outcomes make much difference at all, if any, uh, to the likelihood of reoffending. Hi. Um, thank you, both of you, for your presentation. Um, I think this stat that you've released about um, low numbers of people being cautioned where they should be is very concerning, and I think we need some research into that. Um, and I'd hope Box I would actually pursue that. I also reiterate the need for some regional um, research. I appreciate the issue that you, you get small da data sets, but I think it's really necessary. I do a lot of work out in Western New South Wales, and we see um, really, really concerning issues, and we can't necessarily use that aggregated um, data in a very intelligent way. Um, further to the issue of cautions, what we are hearing is that um, kids very soon after they turn 10 are cautioned very quickly, three times in succession, which means that their access to the scheme of cautioning, warnings and conferencing is completely lost. So um, some research into the use of cautions, lack of and why would be really useful. Okay. <laughs> Just a comment on that. I agree with you, Jen. Um, but I also think, you know, in doing that work, it would be useful to look at the data collected by police on reasons which are. Looks like everyone's yeah. going to advise us on what to do next. <laughs> oh, we love these conversations, don't we? <laughs> well, you've got one more at the front, I think, you. Um, I just wanted to, I, first of all, just make a quick comment that m from my perspective managing conferencing on the far north coast that juvenile justice has become the department for adolescents. Um, I now chair supporting children, supporting families in a vain attempt to try and get uh, those services for our clients. Really, once they're old enough to tell community services to get stuffed <laughs> uh, and create problems in the school, then you know those systems are shut off very quickly to our clients. And I think the government needs to really pay attention um, to the quite desperate need for a focus on adolescents. Um, I also just wanted to ask quickly about cost effectiveness. Um, had there been yeah. an analysis of, yeah? Uh, yeah, really good point. Um, just to flesh it out for people who uh, haven't picked it up, obviously if it costs less to send someone to Youth Justice Conferencing than to court, if they've both got the same likelihood of reoffending, then it's going to be more cost effective to send them to, that's your point, I take it, Youth Justice Conferencing. Uh, we've actually got someone who I saw sneak in, Andrew Weber. There he is who's doing the costing side of the work. I should should have said we haven't finished doing work on this. So Andrew's looking at the costing side. Do you want you want to hold fire until we got the report or speculate? Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> spoken, spoken like a true economist. Everyone knew that. It depends on your assumptions. <laughs> I think, look, well, that work is being done. It's a bit unfair to put Andrew on, on the spot mm. to do it here. Um, coffee is waiting. Can I say before you go, coffee is out that door and out that door, it'll lead to the same place. Um, can I say thank you very much on behalf of Jenny and I for coming to this and giving us your thoughts and uh, I certainly take the message for more research uh, to heart. The second thing is that we are having an annual, not an annual, a biennial crime applied research, applied research in crime and justice conference next February, February February 27, 28, so keep your eye out for notice of that conference. We're really hoping for a good roll-up for it. So once again, thank you very much, and let's see you for coffee.